Uh, good afternoon. This is January 28th, and you are watching House Human Services Committee in the afternoon. And we are hearing from um, the Department of Children and Families uh, within the Agency of Human Services on the Family First Prevention Services Act, both an overview of the legislation and what to date um, the uh, department has um, done in terms of the planning. And with us today, we have the um, commissioner, Sean Brown, Department of Children and Families, and Brenda Gooley, who is the um, operations manager, or I've got your title wrong, I apologize. Um, but she's a very important person because a long time ago, she was my student. <laughs> um, and uh, with that, I will uh, turn, turn it over to um, the commissioner to introduce and move forward. Uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be with the committee today. Um, as you indicated, Brenda Gooley, our Director of Operations for the Family Services Division, um, will be leading the committee through the, uh, the PowerPoint and the legislation. And then we're, the team is here to answer questions. Also here is Sarah Truckle, our Chief Financial Officer, because there are a lot of financial tentacles to this uh, new federal legislation. And I think it's important to understand them the best we can and help explain them to the committee. Uh, Brenda, please take it away. And um, if you can set the stage in terms of whether you want questions in the beginning or whether you would like us to hold questions until you're finished, that I will just let me know. Very good, thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. I am Brenda Gooley, the Director of Operations for the Family Services Division of DCF. And it's my pleasure to be with you here this afternoon, um, along with Commissioner Brown and our um, business office director, Sarah Truckle. And I'm happy to take questions throughout the presentation um, as well as the DCF team here. And we do have a PowerPoint presentation for you this afternoon to take you through some of the key aspects of the Family First Prevention Services Act. Um, so I think it would be good to start that PowerPoint at this point. Thank you. And so that's the team. And I think we can move on to the, the first slide that gives a bit of an overview of the legislation. So the Family First Prevention Services Act is federal legislation that was passed in 2018. And it is considered to be one of the most substantial pieces of federal legislation impacting child welfare across the nation in the past 20 years. Um, and so, Family First is about Title IV-E funding, so Title IV-E of the Social Security Act. And Title IV-E is the most substantial funding stream for child welfare work that occurs across the nation. So child welfare work is, um, those dollars go to fund the salaries of family services staff, they fund all of our foster care placements, all of our residential care placements. Um, so when we say it's the most substantial funding stream, we mean specifically for services for children that are in DCF custody. And this law is really about changing how those dollars are drawn down by states. Um, so the, the overarching goal of the federal government, when the federal government looks at the dollars that are given to states, 90% of the 4E dollars across the nation are currently being spent on the children that are in DCF custody and about 10% on prevention. Um, so part of the intention of the federal government is to really flip that so that more of the funding from the federal government to states is on prevention of children coming into DCF custody um, and, and ultimately reducing the number of children in DCF custody by investing in prevention of that occurring. So that's, um, you know, that's really the overarching goal. And then we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about how, how that's gonna occur. Um, so on slide three, you'll see that what we're really talking about here 
on the prevention side is this is new money. So this is new money from the federal government to states to invest in prevention of children coming into DCF custody. Um, this, is, this is the carrot, if you will. Um, so the carrot is, it comes with strings, of course, that are very clear about here are the ways that states can draw down money for prevention of children coming into care. Um, and it's very specifically talking about that states need to define, here are the children that are at risk of coming into custody. Here are the evidence-based programs that can be provided for those children. And here's the case planning and evaluation and monitoring that will occur to know that these programs really are preventing children from coming into care. Um, and the prevention part of it is broken down into home-based services, substance use related services, and mental health related services. On the next slide, we talk about the, the stick part of it. Um, and I say the stick part of it to say that it's very clear for all states across the nation that um, there is federal money that states have been drawing down that they will no longer be able to draw down effective October 1st of 2021 in Vermont unless we have certain pieces in place. Um, and this is with regard to youth in residential level care that are in DCF custody. So in the state of Vermont today, we have about 150 kids in DCF custody. About half are in residential care within the state of Vermont and about half are in out of state residential placements. And we draw down $40 for the, for the majority of those, those youth today. Um, as of October 1st, unless we make certain key changes, we will no longer be able to draw down those funds for those youth. Um, and one of the more substantial changes that would need to occur is for the residential programs that are providing that service to be what's called qualified residential treatment programs. Um, and so for those residential programs to achieve that status, there are certain things that they need to have in place. They need to be an accredited program. They need to provide 24 seven nursing care. They need to provide trauma informed programming, family inclusive programming and six months of aftercare. So that's something important to bear in mind because of course each and every one of those pieces requires a certain amount of money and um, preparedness for that to occur. So on the next slide, we spend a little bit more time talking about some of the pieces that need to be in place in order to be able to draw down those federal dollars for those, those youth in residential programs. Um, so two key areas to highlight, these are additional pieces that must be in place for that to occur. One is that there would need to be a 30 day clinical evaluation that says, yes, this youth really does need residential care. And the other is a judicial review that would take place at the 60 day mark where the court is reviewing and approving the residential placement. Um, and that second piece is pretty significant when we think about the significant backlog that we have in our court system today. And we estimate approximately 400 additional hearings per year would need to occur in our CHINS system in order to be able to absorb this new requirement. Yeah, I would just jump in and, and add that currently we only need judicial approval when we want to place a youth out of state. So this would really impact in-state placements moving forward because we already are required on, under federal compacts to uh, get judicial approval to move kids out of, into programs out of state. So the next slide talks a little bit about some of the readiness work that we need to do. Um, so the first piece is really looking at, so for the, the 12 agencies in Vermont, um, really 35 different uh, programs that we license, what would it take for them to be ready to become qualified residential treatment programs? Um, so our residential licensing and special investigation unit is in the process of conducting that readiness assessment 
with all of our agency programs. Uh, the other piece of readiness assessment that's occurring is looking at, you know, financially, what would it take for these programs to be able to get to up to speed at this level? Um, and then the third piece of readiness work that we're doing is the development of our prevention plan. Um, so looking, you know, within the state of Vermont, what is the foundation that we already have of prevention programs that could potentially qualify in the eyes of the federal government to be um, Family First Prevention Services prevention programs? Um, what is the population where we're already able to demonstrate these are children and youth at risk of coming into custody? And what level of um, you know, case planning and evaluation and monitoring are we able to put in place by October 1st in order to draw down the 4E prevention dollars as part of our FFPSA prevention plan. And then on slide seven, we continue to talk about some of those operational impacts. Um, so I wanna pause here and say that uh, slide seven talks about what, what I consider to be one of our most significant barriers to drawing down any, any of the 4E dollars. Um, and that is that we need to have the database that can turn 4E on and off at the right time. Um, so we, we do get audited on every 4E dollar that we draw down in Vermont. And you know, having systems in place that ensure that we are drawing down 4E for children or youth that are 4E eligible and that are in placement settings that are 4E eligible um, is part of what we have in place currently around all of the children and youth in DCF custody that are in paid placement. We would need to extend that to the population of children and youth that are either receiving prevention services or that are in residential level care moving forward. And it, we do not currently have a database that has the right mechanisms in place for that to occur. Um, and I know that uh, the legislature has heard quite a bit of testimony on the fact that the Family Services Division utilizes a social services master index system from 1982. Um, so this is a very old database that um, is not currently capable of drawing down any of the FFPSA dollars that we would need to draw down. Um, so that's a pretty significant uh, barrier that we would need to overcome. Uh, we would also need to get those pieces in place for that 30 day clinical review to occur. Uh, we do have on staff a new DCF clinical director who is potentially available to provide that role um, as I mentioned, we would need to have the 60-day judicial review um, for approximately 400 additional court hearings per year. Um, and then we would need to do the, the cost analysis that really looks at, you know, what is the cost to get all of these residential programs up to speed, our database up to a level where it can provide the 4E drawdown that's needed, um, and, you know, does that outweigh the benefit of being able to draw down these new $40. So on the next slide, um, we wanted to just summarize the financial impacts for all of this. Um, so this is really, again, just recapping, we have the database, the internal work that we're needing to do to assess all of this, the provider impacts, right, so knowing within our community of both prevention programs and residential programs, what does it mean for them to, to get up to speed, to provide the level of uh, quality service that is required through the FFPSA, the, um, the judiciary impacts and the cost of that, uh, and then the costs associated with the clinical assessments that need to occur. Um, so, so we have estimated approximately a $1.3 million cost for, um, the, uh, I should say loss really on, on the residential side as of October 1st. 
Um, and, and then we're in the process of estimating the cost to be in compliance of the FFPSA, um, and as well as really the mechanisms that would need to be in place in order for that to occur. So that's a lot of information very quickly. And um, I think at this point, we can just pause and um, ask whatever questions you might have about all of this. Um, we have some questions <clears throat> and uh, we have a question by Representative Redmond, then Representative Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a question about the clinical assessment. Um, are we not doing those presently? And I'm just curious what the distinction is between how we do them now and, and what we would be doing going forward. Yes. So within Vermont, we do currently have a state interagency team and there is a subcommittee, uh, the Central Review Committee that does provide interagency review of all children and youth in the state of Vermont that need residential level care. And that process is ex extensive, requires a local team to convene, requires a level of mental health, education, family services, um, and community involvement and review of anything that is possible to support that child or youth remaining safely within the community. Um, so the scrutiny of is, is residential care really necessary? You know, what is the least restrictive environment that a child or youth can be placed in. Um, so we are hopeful that we can build on that. Uh, the federal government requires that the review is done by someone neutral with expertise outside of the child welfare agency. And currently, you know, we are a part of that central review committee. And so we're hoping what, what we are able to do is actually submit a waiver to the federal government to say, here's what we do currently. Here's what we could add to it be within compliance and hopefully um, you know, have something that is, is acceptable to the Children's Bureau um, and works within the family services and, and Vermont system. Representative Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, that was one of my questions was how, how the um, we learned earlier about the clinician on staff um, that was uh, has been transferred to the central office, and I was trying to figure out how that would be independent. But uh, you sort of described your process that you're looking at. Um, so um, I, I'm recalling um, this is sort of having to do with the judicial review um, aspect of this, and having. Um, had some experience with requirements for judicial review when we closed Brandon Training School many years ago. Um, familiar somewhat with that, um, just the context of that. And it does indeed take a lot of time and staff resources. And that what I'm recalling is that we did have some money set aside for some chins um, improvements, modifications, modernization, dealing with the court system and I, I'm also recalling that we tapped some of that money last year, but I, uh, for a different purpose, but um, can, can you speak a little bit to, um, you know, where we're at with that? Because there was a whole group looking at how the judiciary um, could more effectively and efficiently um, get through not only the backlog, but now looking at these new requirements. And then I just have one other follow-up. Yes, certainly. I mean, I, I, I believe you're referring to the Chins reform effort. And I would say that the, the work of the Chins reform effort is very much aligned with the intention behind the Family First Prevention Services Act, um, that, it, that both, of, both are really about looking at what can we do to ensure that children do not need to come into custody you know, basically, if children are able to safely remain in the home, we want them to be able to do that. And so what can we invest in, in our prevention services that can help keep kids safely at home? 
Mm -hmm. um, and one of the really key places of alignment that I think is incredibly exciting is that in Vermont, we have uh, one of our programs, Parents as Teachers, is actually on the Family First Prevention Services Act clearinghouse, which means that is a program that we, um, through the Chins Reform effort, are, are now using that funding to pilot and expand that in Vermont. And there will be the, the opportunity through the FFPSA to have federal drawdown for that program for years to come. So that'd be an example of some of the, the great synergy that can happen here. And then I think, and just to jump in here, um, and Brenda, please feel free to fill in the gaps that I'll leave on this, but um, uh, some additional monies were allocated earlier um, and the court used that to create a judicial master role as well. And Brenda, I didn't know if you want to explain kind of where that's at right now. Certainly. In Vermont, judicial master is being piloted in Chittenden County and Franklin County. Mm -hmm. And that is um, one, of the, one of the ways that potentially we can use that judicial master to look at are there cases that might otherwise get, you know, take many months to get through the court system. Um, sometimes because of contested hearings, sometimes because of a backlog of, of cases that need to be heard in the court. And so the judicial master can hear those cases and move them along faster. And so it's, it's, um, it's an opportunity to really streamline some of the, the cases and really ensure that there's a more timely process. Thank you. And, and then um, my follow-up was really looking at um, I appreciate that you're looking at a sort of a cost benefit analysis of what does it take to come into compliance versus what we lose in, in federal resources. Um, and that seems that would seem to be, you know, part of the picture, but I guess I'm interested in um, both your, your thoughts and the commissioner's thoughts about, you know, when it comes down to children and families, do you believe that, um, the, the changes that have been made in this federal act are, are beneficial for Vermont's children and families. And so there's, there's one thing about cost, but then I just really trying to look at the, also the, the welfare of families. So, so if I could uh, jump in here, thank you for your question, Representative Wood. I think it's a good one. Um, I think if you look at the intent of the federal law and kind of making it harder and that uh, increased level of review when you wanna use higher ends of care for children. Um, <clears throat> and then the opportunities that it's really looking at expanding funding opportunities for prevention services. And if you really think about our work, that's what it's about is keeping families together, keeping kids safe and, and reducing you know, their trauma um, and you know, of, of whatever they might experience through, through abuse and neglect. But let, let's be honest, there's a trauma of, of, of going through the system as well and coming into custody and going through a, a foster home and whatnot. So um, if you look at the intent of that legislation is really to keep families intact, I think there is a benefit you, you know, to the legislation that way that is really shifting the focus and, and trying to move states to shift their practice from reactive to, to, to proactive and keeping families together and, and reducing harm to kids and trauma to kids. So from that perspective, I, I think there's a lot of value in that. And I think mm -hmm. that over time that that could really help Vermont's children and families over, over the long term. I mean, that's what the Chins Reform Work Group's about. I mean, we've been trying to focus on that, but now this opens up a new pot of funding to actually kind of support that work. Although it does come as you've heard, with some requirements, and you know, and they need to be evidence-based practices. They need to be able to um, uh, uh, collect and and show that they're reducing kid those practices and whatever programs we're standing up on the prevention side are reducing kids coming into custody. And so, anyone who knows our data systems in the state are, are challenged to begin with, and then also many of our providers are smaller and to put those systems in place to kind of capture that data and report that data is a heavy lift. Um, and then also there's some require, and then on the other side, uh, you know, it really is gonna make it more challenging for us, for kids that really do need that higher level of care. There are more hoops to jump through now than we had before. Um, and so that, that, that's where the cost analysis comes in. But I, I, 
so I don't look at it in, in a cost benefit dollars wise. I just look at that, that the law is really trying to get states to reflect on their systems of care and, and let's try to shift it to keep prevention instead of you, you know reacting to the to the harm that's already occurred. Let's prevent it. And so in that that sense, I think it's a it's a great opportunity for the state here. And Brenda, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything. Yes, I would add, I think we're really proud in Vermont that in the last two years, we've reduced the number of children in custody in, in residential level care by 20%. Um, and so, so we have, um, I think, a really solid foundation, interagency foundation of, of working to ensure that youth only go to residential care if they really need to and that they, they stay for, they go into the right program for the right length of time. Um, so I think that foundation is, is very helpful in terms of um, the implementation of the FFPSA moving forward. And I also think it's, I think of it as like, we're, we're at the infancy stage, right? Year one and FFPSA is going to impact states for years to come. So what we do today is probably very small compared to five years from now, 10 years from now, how much um, federal monies we're able to draw down because over time we'll be able to, to build up more of our prevention foundation. Um, so there actually is not a limit on the, the amount of federal monies that you can draw down. It just needs to be in, in a way that meets all of the federal requirements. Um, so I think the law is here to stay. I think over time, um, our capacity to tap the benefit of it on behalf of Vermont will grow. Thank you. I have other questions, but I'll, I'll let other folks have their turn. <laughs> if, 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 you, if you might just want to um, define what residential care means, because I'm not sure that everybody here would have the same understanding of that. Yes. So residential care, sometimes also referred to as congregate care, uh, typically means a youth being placed in a staffed long-term treatment program, sometimes distinguished from a, a short-term, like a crisis stabilization type setting. Um, so I would distinguish it from, um, you know, a, a Brattleboro retreat psychiatric stay or um, a group home. Um, so, so programs within Vermont would be Park Street or Howard Center, uh, Beckett. You know, there are, there are programs that have maybe five or 10 youth, um, other programs that may have dozens um, and, you know, out of state, out of region, there are some residential programs that have hundreds of, of youth in their program. But not foster care, correct? Right, I would distinguish it from foster care, which is a family-based setting where it's not staffed, it's, it's truly a household. Um, our representative Small, before we go on, to your question and um, Representative Brumstead, I want to interject a question or two that at one point was following the um, questions of Representative um, Wood. Um, clearly us being able to implement this plan requires IT and requires judicial investments. Um, I notice on your implementation plan, there is no one, nothing, it does not appear to be anyone from IT, nor does it appear to be anyone from the judiciary. So um, uh, I'm curious as to how this is going to happen in a vacuum. So if I could jump in here, thank you. Um, <clears throat> You know, as you as you heard earlier, uh, this uh, legislation passed in 2018 and gave states several years um, to implement. Uh, and you know, we chose not to implement. Early. We took a buy for two years, and so yeah. we lost the ability during those two years to use the the um and and the law was hard. I mean. They, yeah, I was just going to say, I think it took us a while to understand it's a complicated piece of legislation, an expansive piece of legislation. So just kind of understanding, getting an understanding takes time. Um, and then I, and, and I think 
as you do those calculate started that understanding we recognized there were some cost benefit analysis and that there were going to be um, costs to the state in terms of you know to, to implement this and the impact on our providers could be quite large um, and, and, and so as we move forward, forward yep. where who is on this implementation team that will enable us to implement it yes so if, if I could, I, I think our implementation was waylaid by the pandemic and, and our needing to pivot to, to respond um, to the demands of the pandemic. And I think um, we are now reshifting our focus and we've created a project team within the department that is pulling resources uh, from our business application support unit, uh, our, our, our top line project manager. We are engaging with IT to understand whether we can make fixes to our current uh, child welfare information system um, to, to capture that data, or are we gonna need to build a new one? As you know, there's been, a con there's been conversations across the department um, that all of our IT systems are in right, a right. dire need. And so I think it's just up to now been a prioritization. You know, ie &E is trying to uh, fix the benefit program uh, problems with the access system. Uh, you know, we are moving forward now uh, with uh, a new uh, BFIS system, uh, you know, for the child care system that is literally falling apart before our eyes and taking an incredible amount of workarounds. Um, while the CWIS system is ancient, it, 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 it's working, but we certainly need to either make some enhancements so that we can capture the data and put the pieces in place to track the federal funding and when we can when we can avail ourselves of it and when we cannot, we really need to be able to do that very closely. So um, commissioner, thank you. Um, yes. We're not, I'm not criticizing. No, no, I no, I'm just, I am just uh, trying to put, put the no, context. I, I, and I'm, yes. I was just asking who is on the um, team mm -hmm. and I was looking at the slide, slide yes. nine. And so to, um, to try to remove the, you know, uh, feeling that you need to, be explaining. The last bullet says a work plan has been developed. So if you would share that work plan with us, um, that would be very helpful. Sure. And, yes. then and, we and can, uh, then we will ask more questions. So um, my apologies but, for misunderstanding your question. That's, Brenda, that's, if you'd want to share you know, those, it, kind of dig, dig into the work plan, that'd be helpful. Because then we can ask the questions like who is on it and yeah. um, why aren't they and where are the, um, for instance, where are families? Where are providers? Where are they on? And they may be all there. And so if you share with us the work plan, um, that would be very helpful. Now uh, I'd be happy to. And I, I think what you'll see is that there are, so there is the work plan and within that are the subcommittees that will be forming. So, so the broader work that you're describing has not occurred yet, but it is part of the work plan. Um, yes. And I do just, yeah, I, I do just want to clarify one thing, which is um, just so folks understand when the law went into effect, uh, states were not given the option of um, accessing the prevention part and not the residential part. So if we were to try to draw down 4E monies sooner, we would also immediately be penalized. Um, so we would have immediately lost the $1.3 million a year. Um, so okay. in my mind, that was the main driver for why we did not um, move forward in 2018. There's like, turn to sick context. We have lots of questions from other people. So um, uh, Representative Small and then Representative Brumstead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I hope this one is an easy one. Um, looking at the judicial review, what is the purpose of the judicial review? The purpose is the approval of the placement. So it's really just, um, you know, wanting, it's checks and balances in the system. So beyond the child welfare, child placing agency, having a judicial approval, is residential placement really necessary? May I ask the question in a different way? Is judicial um, review required by the federal, um, by in general federal legislation as it relates to um, child abuse and neglect or is judicial review required by this law or is it required by um, state law or organizational policy? 
a, a little bit of both in different areas. It depends on the decision point along the way. So if the decision about should this child come into DCF custody, certainly uh, judicial review required both state and federal legislation requiring that. With regard to the FFPSA, that specifically requires judicial review for the purposes of placement in residential level care, which is new. Um, some states have always required that. Uh, Vermont has not. Vermont has had the um, authority with, for purposes of placement with the custodian. Um, the exception being out of state residential, which is part of interstate compact law, that for a state to place a child or youth in an out of state residential program, that has required judicial review. Um, and that's a national requirement that Vermont then of course complies with. Thank you. Uh, Representative Small, I interrupted your questions. Do you have more? All of the other ones were asked in the process. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> okay. Um, Representative Brumstead and then um, Representative Redmond. Thank you, Madam Chair. And most of my questions were asked by you, so thank you. <laughs> I, um, I was curious about that two year, why wait two years? So thank you for responding to that. And, my question, I, I guess in my um, experience, when the federal government asks us to change a program as in as big of a change as it sounds like this is, they do give some planning dollars to um, move forward and bring together the right stakeholders and do all those sort of things. So when you decided to wait two years, does that mean that the planning had to wait too? And so there hasn't been any funds to the state um, for those two years or? No, so Vermont did receive $900,000 in FFPSA transition funds. Uh, we have started to spend those funds. One of the first things that we did was invest in a public consulting group providing an analysis of our system of care and uh, recommended improvements to the system. Um, we have also used those funds to invest in a team um, to come together to do some of the business analysis uh, of FFPSA implementation. Um, and then we have funding that's been spent with regard to kin navigation. We haven't talked too much about kin navigation here, but FFPSA, a pretty significant component of it is working with extended family and really ensuring that states are making every effort to engage extended family and to support them in preventing children from coming into care. And then also once they are in care, being an active part of the care of those children and youth. Um, so there's remind, there's a variety of investments. Can in you that. just remind me on the acronyms, what they stand for, just to be sure I'm thinking the right, FN, what was? So it's uh, FFPSA is the Family First Prevention Services Act. Okay, I just want to, thank you. So, uh, Bre uh, Rep Brenda, you will kill um, uh, more things that now you can send. You talked about how you used the um, prevention um, planning dollars. And the first thing you said is you, the department, sorry, I shouldn't ask you, um, commissioner. <laughs> um, uh, the first part they were used for was an analysis or an evaluation of our system and some suggestions. We'd love to see that, please. A absolutely. I think we just received the final report on that. And so we're happy to share that with the committee and maybe even come in and give a review of that and the data contained in that report just to provide some additional context and, and background. That would be great. Um, and if we could have it before we schedule you, um, that can be assigned homework. Yes. <laughs> Um, Representative Brumstead, did you have any additional questions? Okay. Representative Redman. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, a question about the nursing component. I remember when we um, were meeting as joint protection oversight, child protection oversight, there was a whole question around the 24 seven nursing care and the fact that in Vermont, our programs are so much smaller uh, than, you know, like a program in New York City where that might make sense. And I'm curious, how, you know, I know that um, there was talk about 
seeing if we could, you know, have a different kind of arrangement. I don't know where any of that is and how we feel we can comply with that. Yes, and, and Vermont does participate in a national collaborative that, so we're able to see how are other states managing this, and there's a lot of energy for rural states, small rural states, and the solutions that they're coming, coming up with in that regard. And the federal government has clarified that states are able to create a, um, basically an agreement amongst multiple residential providers that if, say, for example, you have a cadre of five nurses that are willing to work together to provide 24-7 support to 10 residential programs, um, it, something like that is potentially acceptable. So, we, so the requirement is that the nursing staff is available. It is not required <laughs> that they are physically on site in the residential program. So we do have a little bit more um, flexibility now than we understood when the law was first passed. Uh, did that answer your um, question, Referendum? Um, I'm going back to the slides and maybe this is part of the analysis that's being done now. Um, but as you're looking at the policy and programmatic impact, um, do we know yet, um, and I can't believe I'm asking dollars and not asking the impact on kids, but I'll ask that later. Um, do we know how many of our programs are accredited? Programs have to be accredited. Right, and so right now, none of our programs are qualified residential treatment programs. Um, and, and in terms of credit accreditation, some of our programs have some level of accreditation, but not necessarily FFPSA um, acceptable level of accreditation. So, so how long um, in the world of academia, our programs have to be accredited and it takes over a year to pull all that stuff together. So um, um, how have we as a state been supporting, prodding um, residential, um, our residential programs? Yes. Uh, so our residential licensing and special investigation unit has met with all of the residential programs in the state of Vermont to review with them the qualified residential treatment program requirements, including accreditation, nursing, aftercare, all components, and conducted a readiness assessment that looks at, here's what you would need, what would it take financially for you to invest in moving in this direction? Larger programs, like Beckett are well on their way in moving in that direction. Other smaller programs are not necessarily concluding that they're able to move in that direction. Okay. Um, we, we do have um, a document that RLSI is in the process of writing. It's not written yet. It's not, I, I don't have it yet. Um, RSI. Uh, so our LSI, I'm sorry, our Residential Licensing and Special Investigation Unit that has been conducting the QRTP, Qualified Residential Treatment Program Readiness Assessment, um, they are almost done. And they, I would say within a month, they should have the write-up of the QRTP assessment. So that will be in March. And the plan has to be approved or just submitted by October? The prevention plan has to be oh. approved. Um, well, it, it can be approved at any time. We can start drawing down FFPSA monies as early as October 1st, um, but any plan can be submitted at any time. We will no longer be able to draw down $40 for youth placed in residential programs as of October 1st, unless we are in compliance with all the pieces that I've outlined here. So how, um, this may be a question, uh, 
commissioner. But sorry, Brent, I'm not sure. Um, um, it may be a question for Sarah Truckle. Um, what do we spend? What, how many four E dollars? How much four E dollars are going right now, currently, to residential treatment? Um, I can get you the exact amount that goes breaks out between in state and out of state, but they're not all four E dollars. What we've estimated for FY twenty two, which you see in the governor's proposed budget, is a decrease in four E revenue of somewhere around $1.3 million. And we are backfilling that with general fund in anticipation of the loss of those federal funds at this point. Okay, so, so to, to, to put that perhaps bluntly, you are planning, the budget assumes that we're not going, that we are going to be, that we're not going to make the October deadline, federal deadline, and so we're gonna take a financial hit in the 4E dollars. The financial hit for the 4E dollars, the 1.3 million looks at our in-state residential programs. We are assuming that our out-of-state residential programs will be compliant with FFPSA and the QRTP requirements because they are uh, larger programs. So we are not currently anticipating a revenue shortfall in our out-of-state placements, just our in-state placements. And that's what we've accounted for in the budget. And, and then I would also just point out that not all of our, our residential treatment providers leverage 4E. There are some that are Medicaid funded and they will not be impacted by this. And I think I would point out that even um, if we're able to come, you know, um, implement this plan, get our plan approved uh, by the federal government, and minimize uh, any financial impact that there are providers that we currently use that we will still need to use that may never be able to meet the stringent uh, qualified residential right. treatment. It, yeah. You know, and so that so those are that that's kind of that calculation you have to you look at. Yes. Yeah, because mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, if I remember back two years ago when we first started talking, to be a qualified residential center uh, for the most part doesn't really reflect the way that the bulk of our resident many of our residential centers um, worked um, and that perhaps they were more directed towards the larger residential treatment centers mm -hmm. so yes. that was one of the um, one of the challenges okay um, I could probably ask last. Um, committee, what other, um, what questions do we have or what, what information? Because this is the, this is clearly not the only time we will be talking about this. Um, one, we've asked for some, some information and, and for some reports. Um, if you can give that to us, um, the two, at least the two right now and anything else we haven't asked for that are, you know, one is a copy of your work plan and the other is that report from the consultant. Um, but what are other sort of information um, that, will, um, that will help us as we go forward and also help us look at the budget? Um, Representative Redmond. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, one of the questions or one of the points made earlier this morning in testimony um, by one of our um, uh, witnesses was about youth voice and youth, youth having a voice or being able to weigh in. And I'm wondering where that, how that factors in here, where I don't know if Family First has that as part of its kind of um, model or if there's a way that we in Vermont are, are um, figuring out how to do that. But I, I thought it was a, a valid and important point. Uh, I would say Representative um, Redmond, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, Commissioner or Brenda, um, they're, they've identified that they have a work plan and they ide have identified that there is an an internal group that only included some, um, I want to say DCF and family services personnel. And uh, Brenda was talking about how um, perhaps the slide was not full. 
and that the work plan might indicate who was on there. And I think um, uh, a fair warning, if you don't have community providers and you don't have um, participants, we're gonna be asking where they are. I mean, one point of clarification um, in terms of the evaluation and report that the public consulting, public consulting group did, that did include focus groups and that did include youth and providers and staff. Um, and the, um, the work is also being done in partnership with the National Center for States. And that um, also includes uh, parent voice. And we are now bringing youth voice onto that team. Um, it's actually a national um, you know, constituent voice that's being brought into that team. And then of course, as you said, Anne, the work plan includes engagement, broad engagement of stakeholders and um, direct service. Yeah you know, lived experience yeah. individuals. I think it'll just be really helpful for us to, um, and it might be helpful for you because we'll stop asking you lots of questions, is if we see some of the specifics and then we'll ask you questions. Uh, Representative Small. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, I wanna see if I am understanding you correctly when it comes to the funding piece. So you mentioned that we can draw both 4E funding as well as, or maybe an opposite to Medicaid funding for youth. And if so, what would differentiate why we would, why we would use 4E funding versus Medicaid funding? I think I'll defer. Uh, it's a very complicated, it, it, it's really the, the level of service being provided and how it's being provided. And so, and it's very complex. And so I'll let Sarah kind of try to explain that a little bit, how the, the funding breaks and how you qualify for different uh, funding streams based on what, how you're providing your service. I, uh, I will do my best to kind of give a, a, a high level answer. Um, and then I'm happy to provide some more details if that's helpful too. But um, so for, for the starters, 4E is a payer of last resort under FFPSA, so that's important. So if we're drawing down Medicaid, we, we can't then also draw down 4E. Um, in addition, we cannot use um, our, what we have historically used is our investment dollars, our MCO, so Medicaid uh, investment under our 1115 waiver for room and board anymore. So we used to leverage Medicaid investment to pay for our residential room and board, and we can't do that anymore. However, we can use 4E to pay for um, some of those costs. So there's a lot of different com com competing different funding streams. Furthermore, depending on the type of provider that you are, depends on whether or not you're a Medicaid eligible provider or you're not. Um, so when we were talking about some of our out-of-state providers, um, we have this requirement under FFPSA, which is um, a qualified residential treatment provider. We also have some providers, um, our PRTF providers, who would leverage just Medicaid dollars. So depending on the type of provider and the, whether the services that they provide would identify whether or not they can draw down Medicaid funds and for which purposes. And then... Um, it also depends on if we're currently using those funds or not. So another big point on FFPSA is that we can't supplant the funds. So it's all, uh, we can expand programs, we can do things in addition, expand the population, but we can't backfill or use FFPSA funds or those 4E dollars to supplant or replace our state funds. Um, so they can only uh, expand those. And then the other side of that um, that comes in is that 4E also has a match requirement, right? So there's a, a state share to that federal drawdown. Um, but if you're interested, I'm happy to send you kind of what is our, our system of care, which is like our uh, PNMI providers, our private non-medical institutions who pull down a Medicaid rate. Um, I'm also happy to provide you with um, what are some of the other providers like Dale PRTF providers and how their funding streams work to just give you kind of that breakdown. It's, it's pretty complicated, but if that would be helpful, I can definitely pull that together. That would be helpful. Thank you. Happy to share. <clears throat> and um, Sarah, I don't know whether you'd be the person to answer this question or whether these are, it's better 
for um, Brenda or the commissioner to um, answer. Uh, Medicaid 4E depends upon, there are multiple decisions, but one of which is what is the type of residential facility? So what is, so for those of us on the committee who are more into people and less into dollars, what is the difference between those two? One is Medicaid and it is attached probably to have to be more, a little bit more healthcare or whatever. Um, and what is 4E it comes out of the Social Security Act. Um, so when I say PRTF, I'm talking a psychiatric residential treatment facility. Um, that would be a, a Medicaid facility. Um, when I'm thinking of our PNMI system and then drawing down different rates, uh, there may be a Medicaid treatment component to that, but we're not talking the room and board side of it. Um, okay, so, so maybe if Brenda could talk about the people or the commissioner. Yes, I mean, I would say when you think about if the 12 or so residential programs within Vermont, the majority of those are um, what we're talking about here in terms of becoming QRTP. Um, whereas a program like Brattleboro Retreat, right, that's, that's a psychiatric facility. Um, so we, we don't have a psychiatric residential treatment program um, other than the Brattleboro Retreat in Vermont that we're using for placement of youth um, within the state, but we certainly do place youth out of state in, in those programs. Um, so okay, it's, so, it's, but, so, but so what's a 4E, you know, what's, what, give an example of a, um, a program that is funded using 4E dollars. The, you said that some of this, some, some, some of the resident, the, the, the comment was that not all of our residential programs are funded. Um, okay, so um, Park Street, for example. So Howard Center, um, which is part of um, Chittenden County Designated Mental Health Agency, has a program called Park Street that provides uh, residential care for youth with uh, sexually harmful behaviors. That is for, we currently draw down 4E for all of the youth in DCF custody placed in that residential program. And as of October 1st, we will no longer be able to draw down that 4E unless they become a qualified residential treatment program and these other pieces. And that's where the one point something. That's right. Is gonna come from. Um, the benefit of these um, that I've heard, um, the purpose or the benefit of this federal shift is at this time um, is to put more money into prevention, whatever. And if I recall, um, what is prevention um, is something that individual states define, how they will define prevention, whether it is primary prevention or whether it is preventing to come into placement is that, I, I, and please correct me if my rec, rec if I it, recall. For the, for the purposes of the Family First Prevention Services Act, it is specific to tertiary prevention, meaning okay. they are talking about preventing children or youth from coming into DCF custody. The actual federal language is candidates for foster care. So what okay. they consider to be, you're, we are preventing children from becoming in foster care. Okay, which, um, Our, our local district offices have different, you know, they, they have the, they have the, um, so the case managers work with kids who are in custody um, and in, um, and some of those kids in custody are still living at home. And some are at this, are, are not. I mean, and so, some are sort of protective service. I forget what you call those. Right, we have a population of, of cases where we actually have what we call family support caseload, which is children and youth that are in a household that, is, that has been assessed to be high or very high risk of child abuse or neglect occurring again in that home. 
Um, and, and you're exactly right, Anne, that is the target population. Okay. So when we submit our FFPSA prevention plan, we will be saying the families that are on the family support caseload are what we consider to be candidates for foster care as evidenced by our structured decision-making tool that demonstrates that they're high risk. Okay. And the other population is um, children that are in the conditional custody of their parents. So we've yeah. had a chins process. They've, they've been, um, there's been concern, child <laughs> protection concern, and there's been a court order that certain pieces need to be followed like substance use treatment, um, but they remain in the home. That's our second target population. <laughs> How is that paid for now? How is some of the, um, for, you know, how is the, um, those, those two, the tertiary paid for now? I mean, do we use for, can we use 4E funds? Is it general funds? Is it MCO? Is it um, TANF funds? What is, what it, um, so, and Sarah can certainly help me out here, but we do draw down some for refunds for our employees' salaries. Um, so we do, we do look at what is the work that the family services workers are doing, and we're able to draw down for refunds for some of that work. Um, and then for the children that are in DCF custody and paid placement, we're able to draw down additional for refunds for that. <laughs> yeah, so, so for the family... Oh. For Go the ahead. family support cases for the staff that support that caseload, the majority of their salary is pulling from general fund, but there is some cost allocation to other sources. Um, but it's all governed by the work in the caseload that they do with the with the majority of the salary pulling to general fund in the cost allocation. Okay, so so um, and sorry, it's on my mind. Um, so that there's there's no um, TANF funds used. The TANF report shifts based on how we draw it down. Um, it's not one that comes to my mind as a, a main driver, but I, I'd have to look at exactly how we're cost allocating based on the last quarter to give you a definitive what the federal funding sources are behind okay. it. Okay, if that's not there, that's fine. Thanks. <laughs> I'll ask it another day. And we can certainly get that for you into in, in the committee because you know, it is complicated and, it, and it's ever changing, you know, based on the cases and the work of the staff. So okay. we are actually in the process of running f finalizing our reports right now. So if you, you'd like, I'm happy to share them with you once they're finalized of what that breakout looks like for this quarter. Uh, thank you. Um, as we whether it's to the committee as a whole or whether it's to the um, what I call the work group, which will be looking at um, that part of the budget, we will do that. Um, but I realized as we were talking, and I should know better, um, uh, chins, what is chins? I mean, I know what it is, but I mean, we are using, um, you know, we're using a lot of uh, an act, ac Acronyms, whatever. I, I can't. I, I speak apologize today. for my acronyms. Um, so CHIN stands for Child in Need of Parent Supervision. So that's the language in state statute that governs when a child comes into, well, comes to the attention of the court as a child in need of care and supervision, and it's through that process that a child would potentially be ordered into the custody of the commissioner of the department. Um, committee, um, given this sort of initiative that we as a legislature need to be sort of um, paying attention to, um, as well as um, some legislation that the department would like us to, to look at. Um, we probably need a, um, a quick, not today, and um, whether, whether it is from you all, um, commissioner, or whether we have ledge council, probably a review of, um, the child protection process um, and that might be um, helpful to all of us um, in terms of moving forward. Uh, Commissioner, I have let the committee know that I will be introducing a bill on behalf of the department around the registry review. Um, and, uh, you know, there may be, um, uh, and, me and many of us on the, uh, uh, on the committee is are will be introducing a bill related to the child advocate 
Um, uh, we have this, um, um, the importance, um, I guess I've, given the fact that we're a little behind the time, little behind, lots of good reasons, but we're a little behind um, um, in terms of moving forward in terms of the Family First Prevention Act. Um, I think it's, well, for us to do our due diligence, we're gonna keep asking you to come in and asking questions so that, um, uh, to help you move forward. Yes, I, I'm, I'm happy to spend more time with the committee and provide whatever information you deem useful. Absolutely, and we can have Brenda's team come in and give an overview of, of the child protection system because it is complicated. Um, let me, um, if, do uh, Commissioner, do you or um, any of your staff have a want to leave us with a final comment? I do not see any more questions. Yeah, I want to just thank the committee uh, for your time today. Um, you know, we are going to approach the implementation of this very thoughtfully with, um, you, you know, what's going to be best for Vermont's families and kids, um, in, you know, in terms of the programs we develop and the services we provide and are able to enhance our leverage with this funding. You know, the financial piece is the financial piece, and we will figure that out. But at the end of the day, you know, this you know, the intent of this is to really uh, put a focus on prevention. And I think that's what's going to be in the best interest of Vermont families and kids is, is prevention. And, you know, that's our goal here is to implement this with, the, with that first and foremost in our mind um, is how do we best serve Vermont's kids to make sure they're safe and are able to stay in with their, with their biological parents in their home. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, committee, do you have um, any further question of the commissioner? Um, we do have one. Thank you. I don't mean to, I don't mean to sound so surprised. I'm yeah, sorry. No, thank you, Madam uh, Representative. Uh, representative. I, I'm, I'm ready to ask my question. Uh, <laughs> um, as far as... Um, and thank you, uh, Commissioner and Brenda and Sarah, so much for uh, presenting. Uh, I'm definitely learning a lot, so thank you. Um, my question has to do with the um, the uh, QRTPs and how do you have a sense of how many of them are uh, ready or open uh, to create this uh, transition to becoming certified? Uh, Commissioner Brown mentioned that um, some uh, might not reach that point um, just due to limitations. Um, and because it sounds like we're making some pretty, uh, there's also some pretty big, uh, you know, systematic requirements as far as our judicial system and things like that. And to just think that um, both the state and the providers will be taking this on together. Um, so I guess, uh, have you started that sort of outreach process and gauged how, how ready they are to make these changes? Yes, and that is, so um, that is the work that our residential licensing and special investigation unit is doing is meeting with them. And I, I think generally speaking, they're open to it, but it costs money. And so that's part of the, um, you know, the work ahead is to figure out, you know, what efforts can be combined, you know, such as the nursing care, and maybe they could enter into, you know, a multi-agency agreement around certain, uh, you know, certain systems, um, you know, having the aftercare, um, being more trauma-informed. I, I think that these are principles that people are really aligned with, um, but for some of the smaller programs, it can be really challenging financially to think about how to get there. Um, so, you know, that's, I think, part of the process that we're, we're part of our readiness assessment. Thank you. Um, Rev. Uh, Representative Wood. I was going to wait till later, some other time to ask this question, but since it sort of just came up, uh, um, uh, Brenda, on the financial side of things, I guess I'm trying to figure out. So if 
our programs come into compliance with these things, um, wouldn't that make us eligible for additional, wouldn't that make them eligible for an increase in their rates, uh, additional, additional uh, payment to offset those increase in costs since that they are requirements? Well, so becoming a QRTP is part of it, but then we also would need to have the judicial review in place and the clinical review in place. Um, so all those different pieces need to be in place for us to be able to draw down those 4 e funds. Um, and, and then it becomes, you know, what is the rate of reimbursement, the daily rate for each youth who's placed in that program that the program receives? And, um, you know, so that would be, I think, part of, part of the work ahead is figuring out, you know, what is the rate that each program should receive moving forward. Yeah, and I would just point out um, that the first 14 days of each residential placement are still 4E eligible. So if a youth remains in that program beyond that, that we will not be able to draw 4E dollars down unless we meet those judicial reviews, the clinical reviews, and, and all of those other pieces within that 60 day period as well. Thank you. Representative Vaughn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is, is the New Hampshire company that we're using now a qualified residential treatment program? I'm sorry, I was just noting, uh, should I be turning off live stream? No. Oh. Okay. <laughs> we're still, we're still. Yeah. We, we I apologize. Are still, um, I'm, um, I, I'm getting um, consultation. Yeah. Thank so, you. I apologize, um, and, I missed and, your question because I was distracted yeah. by that. <laughs> well, uh, um, I've. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, Representative McFawn asked if the, uh, Beckett, who runs a program serving Vermont youth. We have this, you know, the youth in the New, in New Hampshire and their programs, but also they run the Vermont School for Girls. Um, and so uh, Representative McFawn was asking, are they, are, are they a qualified residential treatment program at this time or meet the requirements of that? If they're not already, they're very close. I, I mean, they're definitely way ahead of other programs. They were very clear from the beginning that they were going to become a QRTP because they're serving so many states. Um, so I, I don't know officially if they are right now, but I know that they are almost all the pieces in place that needed to be in place are there for, for Beckett. Okay, so uh, when we finish putting the money into their, their facility in Newbury, I'm hoping that they will be accredited by then, if they're not now? Um, so I, I believe because the Newbury site, um, the Covered Bridges is a locked facility, I don't know that that is actually able to be a QRTP. I think the nature of the uh, population served in that setting um, is not, uh, not a program that, that could draw down those funds. Okay. Yeah, thank is, you. We did explore that in the funding of that program, and it isn't eligible for 4E based on the population that it serves and the regulations around drawing down those funds. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, clearly, we're going to have lots of conversation about all of these issues, and but I think we have probably come to the conclusion today in terms of where we are and uh, committee, I will see you all tomorrow. Um, 15 minutes when we get off the floor, when again. Um, yes. Um, when again, we can um, see you, Commissioner. Yes. Um, and um, Brenda, I believe you and I are co-hosts of this meeting. Um, but uh, since you, uh, um, so I am going to um, close this meet. If you, as co host, are you a co host or the primary host? I, I know I am at least a host, if not a co host. Okay. Um, then if you are the host as opposed to a co host, um, 
Uh, this will uh, end our um, committee meeting um, today. And um, as we turn off, we will be leaving YouTube as well.